we are gathered here today with the amazing Kelly Wendorf to talk about building better humans, which, oh my goodness, do we need to build better humans because look around what we've done so far. Not all great. So I'm looking forward to learning the magic formula um, <laughs> on how we can all be better. And that's what this entire event has been about, hasn't it? Um, Awake or Arise is all about how can we be better ourselves? How can we help others be their best selves? Um, and how can we inspire others to help others to be their best selves? And throughout all of this, coaching has been a thread and will continue to be a thread because it's pretty amazing. Um, I always, always, always talk about how much coaching helps me just in daily life. Um, coaching skills, I should say, because it's not just necessarily being a coach or being coached. It's the kinds of things that we learn as coaches and uh, apply that make life and work and family and everything a little easier. So um, yay coaching. Uh, but today we are here with a soon to be best-selling author of Flying Lead Change. Check it out. It launched yesterday. Oh my goodness. Um, I'm going to put a link right now to, I was ready for you, Kelly, link to Amazon to buy it. Um, read it. It's good. I haven't read it yet, but I know it's going to be amazing because Kelly's amazing. Um, I'm still waiting for my copy. And yeah, today we, this, we are here with our amazing Kelly, who is going to tell us um, about her book and she's going to tell us how to build better humans. So um, Kelly is a coach. She is um, an animal lover, a nature lover. Um, she's one cool chick. Uh, she's a wonder woman. And when I go off cam or later, I will put a link in the chat to an interview I did with Kelly for the Wonder Woman Wednesday series, uh, which was lovely. And we got to know Kelly a bit more. So um, Kelly, introduce yourself, but you know, I'm going to sample to the video so they can learn a lot about you from that other video too. Um, but yeah, welcome everyone. Welcome Kelly. Yeah, welcome. I'm always excited, but like right now I'm really excited. So yeah. I'll stop talking and over to you. Thank you so much, Magda. And thank you just for the opportunity um, and all that you do and how you put yourself at service. Magda is going to be my wing woman today. I told her to please, you know, reach out if anything goes wrong with tech or sharing or anything like that. Um, because we're going to be quite interactive in our time together today on our little uh, construction site of building better humans. Um, and just hi out there to all of you, wherever you are in the world. We're going to be um, using the chat function and the Q&A function um, and, uh, and, just, um, and just a little bit about me. <clears throat> I'm a master certified coach. I'm the founding partner of an organization called Equus. We are a leadership development organization here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Um, we are a coaching organization and we have a really special process as well that engages horses as co-facilitators of change. So we work remotely with our clients, but for some people who get to come here to our campus, um, we do a really special process as well. Most of my clients are coaches. That's probably the lion's share of my clientele, um, which I love because, um, coaches are such a uh, rarefied group of people that are constantly curious. And, um, and so today, this, this time together is for coaches, um, for leaders, and I hope you enjoy yourself. And um, <clears throat> so I just love to hear where everybody's from. We've had a few people put in with the chat, but I just wanna know if you're here, just a quick hi and where in the world you're from. We have people from Uruguay and South Africa, Maryland. Um, we have someone else here from Santa Fe. Thank you, Gustavo. He said, both girls look great. That's great, thank you. Greece, Chicago, Atlanta, India, Denver. Hi, everybody. It's really great to have you here. Um, I love how Zoom pulls us together. So, 
I first thought about this workshop when Magda and Ron reached out about this conference, um, Building Better Humans, and it was just in direct response to, to the title of this conference, Awake, Aware, Arise. And as we all know, wherever we are in the world, we are in unprecedented times. And it's just so apparent, as Magda said earlier on this call, that we just have to do better, um, each of us. And, um, and in order to do better, we have to be better and, and, and do more than we've been doing. And that's a lot for many of us because we're already very, very engaged. And it's just so obvious that every single person matters. And now is really our time. And probably, um, you know, many of you have sensed that your whole life that you would be called to action in some way. And so here we are. Um, so today we're going to explore some key principles and practical takeaways for how to grow positively. They're going to make a measurable change in your life um, and, and assist you not only to be a better leader and a better coach. Um, and by the way, I define leadership very broadly. If you, if people or things rely on you in any way, um, if ideas rely on you, if projects rely on you, if family members rely on you, then you are a leader. So, and as we all know, as leaders and coaches, the more we grow and expand and deepen, then the better we are to serve others to do the same. So today we're gonna be exploring some of those principles and, um, and tools, and I hope that you come away with some really practical things that you can apply to your life and to your clients um, and your team. And I'm gonna be presenting five tools. Obviously, there's infinite <laughs> tools to building a better human, like Magda with her beautiful makeup that she applied, anything goes. But, um, you know, we only have so much time, and these five I feel like are quite primary. Um, and we could even spend a day on each of these, but hopefully we can dive just a little bit deeply together on what they mean. Um, and <clears throat> we say tools, but I'm going to use the word commitment because we can have tools and we can leave them laying around. But part of what's going to make these tools effective is if we commit to them. So today it's about five commitments. Um, I'm going to invite you to listen just a little bit differently today as well. Often when we listen, we are listening for agreement um, and likes and dislikes. I agree with this. I don't agree with that. I dislike this. I like that. But that kind of listening has very little value because all it does is reinforce the way that you already see the world. So today, listen for insight instead of agreement. That's my invitation to you. Um, listen carefully for just that one tiny idea that could change everything for you. And, and listen for things that you may not like or that you disagree with and just try on for size. Well, you know, what if it was true? and just stretch yourself in that way. Um, so you're listening for insight. You could say that that's our first commitment together. It's about being a learner instead of a knower. And part of building a better human is being, being a learner. So listen for insight, and that'll be our kind of fundamental way of being together and exploration and curiosity. So, Let's get started together. I'm going to share the screen. And here we go. <laughs> Mark is like, yes, so, see, I'm a really an analog gal. So this is really stretching me, I can tell you. Um, so I'm going to start with a quote. This is by the wonderful Sonia Renee Taylor, who is an author, a humanitarian activist. We will not go back to normal. Normal never was. 
Our pre-corona existence was not normal other than we normalized greed, inequity, exhaustion, depletion, extraction, disconnection, confusion, rage, hoarding, hate, and lack. We should not long to return, my friends. We are being given the opportunity to stitch a new garment, one that fits all of humanity and nature. I love this quote because it's about a brand new way forward. It's about new systems, new uh, models, new processes, new ways of being. Um, and something that, and that she includes not, all, not just all of humanity, but humanity and nature. Because obviously if nature's not doing well, we're not gonna do well. So I'm gonna open up the chat to everyone and let's just con consider together like what qualities in your mind, given where we are, given that institutions are falling down, structures are melting, um, the climate is really showing uh, signs of extreme change, um, the economy is tanking, and our health with the, with the pandemic, you know, rising again. What do you think are some qualities that humans need to have now to stitch that new garment? And why don't we just throw it in the chat and just open up the floor a little bit. And Magda, you'll have to um, speak out loud what you see. Yeah, that'd be great. Open mind, compassion so far. Compassion, altruism, integration. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna add one too, intention, mm -hmm. empathy, love. Yeah. Both and thinking versus either or. Mm -hmm. Be more human. Realization that humans are part of nature. Gratitude, help others, focus. Compassion again. So I'm gonna invite each of you now as you write some of these qualities, these characteristics. Write, I hope you've brought a journal, a, a pen and paper, have it somewhere. Write down for you some, either a characteristic or a couple of those characteristics that resonate most for you. And the reason I'm gonna have you write them down is, <clears throat> towards the end of our time together today, I'm gonna to show you a process on how to hardwire those, what we might call temporary states, where we might sometimes feel compassion or sometimes be able to hold an either or mindset and turn them from a state into a long-term trait. So that is gonna be one of our commitments. And so I'd like you to kind of you know, track something that you would like to personally hardwire into your body. This is part of the building, is the hardwiring. So I just put up um, that on uh, Mentimeter. If you guys want to click on that, um, then you can add in those words on Mentimeter, and I will do my best to just share it. And cool. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> We're pushing you technologically as well. Possibly. So here are the five uh, commitments that we're gonna work with today. Taking radical responsibility, feeling all feelings, be an ally, engage in courageous conversations, and change your optimal states into traits, which I just spoke about. I imagine um, that many of these, if not all of these, you've heard about before and um, that you've, you know, definitely explored on your own before. Um, but in the, in the spirit of listening for insight, um, we are going to be engaging with these commitments in probably different ways than you have before. So with each with each commitment, we're gonna spend some time working sometimes experientially and sometimes just with reflective processes and sharing. Um, so let's start with our first commitment, taking radical responsibility. 
I commit to taking full responsibility for the circumstances of my life and for my physical, emotional, mental, and spiritual well being. I commit to supporting others to take full responsibility for their lives too. I will refrain from blaming others and myself from being a victim, hero, or a perpetrator. So this is important that it's number one because it's sort of foundational to all the other commitments. <sighs> Taking 100% responsibility doesn't mean that you're a martyr or a rescuer and you're, or you're a hero but it does mean that you're taking 100% responsibility for that which you can control and 100% responsibility for your learning, your growth, your attitudes, um, how you meet the challenges that come forward. When we're not taking 100% responsibility, we're coming from a more fear-based place and we get caught up in, you know, everybody's probably heard of the Cartman drama triangle the hero, perpetrator, victim triangle. And that, that triangle is fueled by fear. It's also fueled by blame and shame and guilt. And it's really easy for us to get into that cycle because of course, if, if something is happening to me, then I, can't, I don't have any control about it and I'm just helpless. And in some ways that feels like that shift of blame is useful, but it's really, really powerless. Um, so the victim's mindset is very much to me. Things are happening to me. Um, I can't help it. Uh, it wasn't my fault. I didn't make it happen. The hero mindset is, tends to be a mindset that is very, um, averse to tension and conflict and pain and so heroes will step in because they don't have that capacity or the mindset i'm going to say these aren't people these are mindsets the the mindset does not have the capacity to feel those uncomfortable feelings and so they'll often step in very quickly with rescuing and enabling um, or temporary solutions that aren't useful and it it often holds other people as small like they're not really capable of doing it. And so you in that mindset will rush in. <clears throat> Taking 100% responsibility is not being the hero because part of understanding 100% responsibility is not taking more than your 100% as well. So some of us who are uh, great doers and great achievers, this can be a real edge for us to not take more than our 100%. Of course, the perpetrator blames and points the finger. And sometimes we run this circle inside ourselves, this triangle where we blame ourselves um, and point the finger at ourselves. So the shift then is, what can I learn from this? Where can I grow from this? Where do I have power in this? What is mine to do in this? And when we take 100% responsibility in that way, we empower others to take their 100% responsibility. If we take 120% responsibility, we actually end up enabling the fragility of another and their 80%. So, so kind of consider ways that your robustness of 100% can meet another person's robustness and their 100%. So just Throwing in the chat, this consideration of 100% responsibility, not more, not less. What might shift in your life if you took 100%? I'll just throw some of these in there. Well, as we're waiting for people's answers, um, first of all, Kelly, let me know if you want me to use Mentimeter for these kinds of things too, because I can. Um, but for me, I think I would feel a lot lighter because I tend to take a little bit too much responsibility, I think. So a hundred percent, I think would feel just right. Um, I think I would be less anxious. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for me too. I tend to, I tend to flip in the victim hero place. I'll take too much responsibility and then I'll feel victimized by it. <laughs> so I can ping pong in those places. 
a hundred percent is quite a it's quite a sweet spot um, but what I notice for myself is when I'm at that place um, I call forth the empowerment of others as well so a couple answers came in um, someone said they will feel centered someone else said the feeling of letting go we are responsible for our thoughts, emotions, words, and actions. It's crazy. Honestly, like I feel weird right now because I just started thinking about a hundred percent what that would feel like. And it's like, <laughs> huh, I don't remember feeling at a hundred percent. I'm always right. <laughs> right. <spectrum. laughs> well, that's really important because, um, a lot of you are saying, you know, it ha even though I didn't ask what, what it would feel like, I said, what would might happen? But what everybody is starting to say is, oh, it would feel like this. It would feel like that. And, and, I would, and for those of you who are getting a felt sense of what 100% responsibility would feel like, I would love for you to just kind of track that feeling, take a moment and track that felt sense of taking 100% responsibility. Take a few moments now. Where do you feel it in your body? How do you feel it in your body? Because in our last commitment, that's another state that we can turn into a trait, okay? So for me, for example, how I feel when I'm taking 100% responsibility is my posture becomes more erect. I feel more easy in my stomach. My breathing slows down. Um, I'll even notice like if I'm on a coaching call and if I'm taking more than my fair share, if I'm trying too hard for my client, everything gets a little up here. And I can track myself and go, hmm, there it is. There's me taking on more responsibility than I need to. <sighs> Just drop back down, change my posture. And that changes how much responsibility I'm taking. Similarly, the victim position will have a different feeling, right? And the persecutor position will have a different feeling. So track your feelings as we're working together because they're going to be useful to you later in, this, in our time together. Anything else pop up, Magda, that we want to? Um, someone said that they would feel not dependent. They, I feel not dependent from others, more in control. Um, mm -hmm. Someone yeah. else talks about feeling it in their stomach. Yeah, feeling empowered and control came up a couple more times. Nice. So, you know, and we'll get to this later, but I'm loving that people are going into how, they, how it feels because... Um, so often we have these realizations that we do want to take 100% responsibility, not more, not less, but our habits are that we do something else. When we change it from just a cognitive idea of something we want to shift in our life and we drop it in to rewiring our body, then the habits change. So this was so exciting. This is part of why I said building better humans, because you literally can build these things inside. So stay tuned. So a little journal exercise for you. We'll just take about three, four minutes for this. And here are the journal questions. And Magda might want to type them into the chat. Um, this is a very powerful question. So here's question number one. Who or what do you blame for your unhappiness or frustration. And be really honest about this question. Don't just sort of blush it over and go, I don't blame anybody. <laughs> I don't blame anything. There might be a place in your life where you haven't quite reached what you want or something is causing frustration or some rub somewhere. Who or what do you blame? And this is just for you. You don't have to throw it in the trap unless you feel like it. Second question, what is it costing you? And third question, what is one practical action step that you can take to shift the responsibility back to you? 
where you're more empowered? What is one practical action step? By the way, um, if you have an insight that comes while we're, while we're talking together, please put it in all, put insight in all caps in the chat. And that'll just give Magda a sense of like, oh, here's someone popping with some insight and she can just name it. So insight, and if you have a question, you can put uh, that in all caps as well, question in all caps, and then write your question. Um, since everyone's still journaling, uh, an insight I just had about myself um, was that I try to not to blame anybody. I try to take responsibility for my actions because I want to feel empowered and because I was previously in a position where I wasn't that. Um, I was in an abusive relationship and it just it destroyed my soul. And but what I just realized was that a lot of times um, I still do blame that a little bit. If I react in a way that I don't like it, I, in my mind, say, well, it's because I went through this thing. No, it's not. Like, whatever I just did is me. So stop the as a crush. Insight. Yeah. So you, so the bl you blame the past scenario for the present showing up now. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. Yeah. Great insight. Really great insight. Yeah, someone else just said that um, when I blamed others, I couldn't even enjoy my own accomplishments. Mm -hmm. It's interesting how. Yeah, yeah. wow. Uh huh. Right. <laughs> That's a really, see, I'm learning stuff all the time. That's a really big one. Yeah. We'll just give everybody a couple more minutes because these are deep questions. And of course, you can go back to them, but we have time. We have time today. Any last insights before we move on? Okay, here's our next commitment. Feel all feelings. I commit to feeling my feelings all the way through to completion, the pleasant ones and the unpleasant ones. I commit to feeling them as sensations and will resist naming them, blaming them, judging them, or numbing them. So um, this is one of my favorites. And for, for many of us, it's a, it can be a tricky one, especially if we've had a lot of meditation and uh, mindfulness practices. A lot of conventional practices have us focusing on our breath or that still point or just being with sort of the quiet center kind of leaving the rest of the world out <clears throat> and i'm inviting you to turn that on its head and let it all in to become really porous so the buddhist nun pema children is a wonderful teacher in this practice of letting all sensations come in as is. So is Byron Katie, by the way. Um, it's a practice of allowing our sensations, our emotions to be there without our interference. Labeling these emotions can get tricky because if I have a sudden kind of drop in my chest and a sort of heaviness of heart, and I call it grief or I call it depression, then from there I can very easily ratchet up to my brain and try and problem solve that emotion. And it keeps me in a loop, a perpetual loop. We get into, this is a good emotion, this is a bad emotion, this is a preferred emotion, this is not such a good, this, is, this emotion means this about me and that emotion means that about him. And it gets us in a kind of, hamster wheel of um, negativity and anxiety and 
takes us away from just pure presence. Presence in its purest definition is being with everything as is. Compassion, to use that word that was put in the chat a couple of times earlier. The definition of the word is to feel with. That's all it is. That's all compassion is. Compassion is not sweetness, kindness, niceness, empathy. Compassion is feeling with. So this is, this is the deepest form of compassion. Being with your sensations as they are, being with the other's sensations as they are. Um, Pema Chodron kind of equates emotions to like weather patterns. Sometimes it's a hurricane. Sometimes it's a spring storm. Sometimes it's sunny. Sometimes it's windy. But we wouldn't want to change those elements on earth. So why would we want to change that life force inside of us? It's just life force, just elemental life force. When we get into labeling these sensations, we get what's called meta emotions. Meta emotions are feelings we have about feelings. And then we have feelings about the feelings that we have about feelings. So you can see what a rat wheel we get onto. So this is about really dropping into the very life force that is moving through us as human beings connected to the multiplicity of all of life into the greater cosmos. It's quite an expanded state. And it also helps us to take 100% responsibility like we were talking about earlier, because the more we're able to have and experience large, sometimes uncomfortable feelings, the greater capacity we have to just be with it, the less prone we are to necessarily try to like fix or rescue because we can't tolerate, say, conflict, the sensation of conflict. But if you tune into the sensation of conflict, it's just a kind of jagged sensation. That's all it is. It's not comfortable, but it's not bad. Just culture and society told us it was bad, but it's just not comfortable. So I would love to hear in the chat just anybody's kind of, what was, what's been your experience? What have you been taught about emotions? And how has that limited you? For example, growing up as a young girl in America, I was taught that I was to be nice and I couldn't be angry and I couldn't have strong opinions and I certainly couldn't offend anybody else. So I was sort of hemmed in emotionally and that did come at a great cost. But just uh, share with us what your experience has been and what you were taught about your emotions and how that so might have, when you hear emotions from your clients or those that you lead or your family members. Sorry, I wanted to jump in because, uh, you know, I too was taught to be nice and all those things. However, um, I'm very, very stubborn. So it was always very hard for me to do anything that I was told. But, um, What's interesting is that it served me really well because I grew up in communist Poland where it was like you, you were taught to do certain things because literally you had to. And um, <laughs> I still remember in school, I used to get uh, eye rolls from and get in trouble because on picture day, you had to wear your scout uniform or you had to wear white and navy and you had to be very still. And there's always class pictures and I'm like, in the background and I think it's helped me that yeah the fact that I just kind of got embraced the emotions um it's helped me with confidence all through life hmm. um so at least it's a positive but you know yeah. <laughs> uh someone has okay answers are coming in I was taught to be modest I still find it difficult to share any accomplishment with others thinking that perhaps it could be taken as show off yep same here mm -hmm. I won an award, an international award last week. First time I'm saying it out loud, have not announced it on social media, have not put a press release. So I can totally relate. Now I feel weird that I said it, but anyway, we're growing here, right? We're growing um, and you know, just to kind of stay with that since it was also echoed in the chat, 
to build the capacity to feel pride, to feel that kind of swell of like, oh, wow, look what I did. You know, yeah. some people have hard time feeling joy. Some people have a hard time feeling anger. Some people have a hard time feeling success, right? So to like allow those feelings, the fullness of their expression inside your body becomes a practice. Because of course, when we, we, we can't selectively numb out emotions. If we numb out a little bit of our feeling of success, then we're also numbing out a little bit our sense of joy and a little bit our sense of connection and all the other things. So it, it, it behooves us to kind of open up the floodgates of our felt sense in our human body and allow ourselves to feel difficult things, even if those difficult things are good things, right? Yeah, what else? Someone else talked about, I was taught to hold my emotions in and not to express weakness. Now that I have learned to honor my emotions and express them as needed, I no longer hold them in. Mm. Someone else said, be strong, boys don't cry. Yeah, that's a really, really difficult one, don't cry. And then as leaders and as coaches, when we're, when we ourselves struggle with just being with our feelings as is, then when our clients have feelings, subtly we're not really sure what to do with theirs either. And again, there's this beautiful place between repression and expression, which is just being with. And when we're there, then we know how to be with others' feelings and we know if we would want to express, we can express them skillfully. So this is a really, again, a sweet spot. Anybody else? Um, yeah, someone just said, be vulnerable, express how I feel, no matter what. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah. So, we're gonna do a little exercise with this right now. <clears throat> so just kind of put yourself in a kind of comfortable position wherever you are. And you can close your eyes for this. And we're just gonna do a little experiment. And I would like you to conjure in your memory and your body's memory, a felt sense of something that is or was difficult for you, an unpleasant feeling. Now you don't have to go somewhere really traumatic. I just want to get some mild sense of discomfort. So some frustration, some awkward vulnerability, some uncomfortable feeling. And I would like you to conjure it and bring it forward deliberately. And I'm going to give you a few moments to do that. Usually it starts with a memory and then the body goes, whoop, now I remember how that felt. Maybe you had an argument with someone. Maybe you felt you disappointed somebody or somebody made you mad. Or you became angry in the face of somebody's action. It's probably more accurate. And now let it really have its way inside your body. I would like you to become deeply acquainted on a really granular level with that sensation. Where does it kind of show up in your body? Your belly, your chest, your head, your arms, your legs, everywhere? Is it centralized somewhere? Is it soft or is it jagged? What's the texture? And stay away from, again, labeling it in the traditional conventional, you know, this is sadness, this is anger. Just stay granular on a sensational level. Is it hot? Is it cold? And really acquaint yourself with it fearlessly. And now I invite you for two minutes, we're gonna do this for two minutes, to be with that sensation, 
exactly as it is without any agenda to change it, to make it better, to make it easier. Meet it just as is. Two minutes. And if you find your mind starting to get activated by the feeling, just drop back in, get reacquainted. One more minute. Keep getting really acquainted being with. The aim is not to make it change in any way. Okay, so I'd love to hear from people in the chat what they noticed happened towards the end of the two minutes. What did they notice happened to that feeling? Is it okay if I share? Yes, please. I okay. love it. <laughs> Oh, someone said the feeling reduced. Um, yeah, yeah. For, um, it was still there. For me, for me, it was in my throat. And it was just like a jelly lob that was starting here and expanding and then going into my ears and my brain. And um, it was pulsating. But as we went on, it just became less pulsating. So it felt like it was occupying less space. Yes. Yes. Interesting, isn't it? Mm. Someone said it's become less intense. It was fading away. Yes. Isn't it interesting that paradoxically that when you be with, again, the word compassion without any agenda, just purely be with how it, whereas what we normally do is fight it, engage with it, try to fix it, go to therapy about it. Da, 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 da. This is the power of being with feelings exactly as is. Anybody else before we move on? Okay, beautiful, beautiful work. And I loved how granular you got, Magda. You know, again, the more you acquaint yourself with it, how it lives in your body, the more power you have to build capacity to be with it, and then it just, but here's the trick. Don't do this so that it'll go away. <laughs> That's not the point. The point is to be with it because it's just true, because it's just life force. Yeah, great. Okay, next. Commitment three, be an ally. I commit to learning about differences and diversity in my community, my workplace, my country, and with my clients. I will educate myself on how to be sensitive to others' differences and be an ally for them in meetings, gatherings, family settings, and other settings so that they feel included and not othered. Other has become a new, a new verb. This has become really important, especially in American um, public discourse, but increasingly more around the world on the heels of some really terrible atrocities that have been happening for 12,000 years, but certainly come to the fore recently, um, particularly with people of color. There is arising a new expectation, talking about a new garment that we need to knit together. There is a brand new expectation on leaders, on community members, on coaches to be literate onto ways that we subtly exclude others, way more literate than we were five years ago. Um, 
if we're going to hold communities of diversity, if we're going to help other people move forward and then we're going to knit back together our humanity, we have to understand the differences and the traumas and the historic traumas that are still pervasive. And if we don't address those and work with them, we can't knit back together. And kind of spiritually bypassing this piece and saying, hey, we're all one, I don't see color. Uh, it actually, um, it prevents this from healing. So we can't bypass this step. We need to become literate on this, um, a term that's called subtle acts of exclusion. Um, it's also known as subtle acts of inequity. And these are often, they used to be called microaggressions. Most of us are finding that to be a not very, um, not a very useful word because it's so blamey and can create a lot of defensiveness. So subtle acts of exclusion, subtle acts of inequity. These are subtle, often well-intended actions, remarks, things said or asked that exclude people with marginalized identities, ethnicity, age, religion, gender, sexual orientation. And, <clears throat> you know, most of our countries operate on a caste system. And we have those who are most privileged right down to those least privileged. And I don't necessarily mean financial, I mean status. So those of us on higher privilege need to be very, you know, sort of sensitive to those with less privilege and, and be sensitive to how that shows up in space and how we, um, you know, how we other people make them feel excluded. One way to do that is to create, besides becoming really literate about these SAEs, um, <clears throat> and there's a lot of books about this out there. Um, there's a book that's on my handout that I'll, I'll uh, recommend, but is to create a super easy to follow, agreed upon system inside your organization um, where people can name SAEs and care for the SAEs and move on and everybody gets to grow together. Um, so, <clears throat> um, let's see, I think I'll show the slide now. So here's the model. The model is, uh, I call it the Jedi model of inclusion for subtle acts of exclusion. I uh, got this name from my friend, Toby Herslick, who runs um, Biomimicry for Social Innovation. And this also comes from Tiffany Jana's book, um, Subtle Acts of Exclusion, a really, really powerful book. If you're gonna get one book on this, that's the one. Um, it's really simple, very, very uh, useful. The model goes like this, pause the moment or the action. So if you're in a meeting and you notice that an SAE might've happened, pause. And we're all gonna, you know, you'll create agreement in your circles, in your meetings that this can happen. So nobody's wondering what the heck is going on. And it might go something like, oh, wait, whoa, whoa, something's just happened. I just need to pause for a second and address something. The second step is to assume good intent. Assume that the person who, um, I'm not gonna say committed, who, who, who did the SAE, um, did so by good intention. Maybe they thought they were paying a compliment. Maybe they thought they were saying a joke. Maybe they were genuinely curious about something. Then name the SAE and its impact. So, you know, uh, George, that comment that you made about the, the, uh, about the South could have been problematic, and here's why. Problematic is a great word to use because it doesn't really assign a lot of blame. Who names the SAE? It can be the person who's received the SAE. It can be a person who's observed it in the room. Or you can call yourself out and say, oh, wow, I just realized that I just excluded you. Um, one way I notice it happens as an American is my, is that nationalism is a sort of a Merocentric mindset that I take when I'm working with people all around the world and assuming that they understand my terms, my um, things that I'm saying, and it just excludes them, it others them. So that's just an example um, for us all to be mindful of. 
And then you care for the SAE. You address it. You talk about why it was problematic. And it's a time for the person who did execute the SAE to say, oh, wow, I, gosh, I have so much to learn. Thank you so much for that feedback. I really appreciate it. And I, I am sorry that I distressed you or I hurt you or I made you feel like you were excluded. That, that's simple. And then have patience, but expect progress. This is a really, really uh, triggering place for human beings. And if we're gonna build better humans, it's where we need to go together. So in the chat, just put any time where you have felt othered because of your gender, because of your sexual orientation, because of your skin color, because of some assumptions somebody made about you. Just put it in the chat, you know, um, in any way where you just felt excluded or othered and how that felt. I'll give an example because it's one of the reasons why I love my job right now. Um, not only because Coach Arya is amazing, but also because I'm remote. Um, and every leadership role that I've had before, I was usually the only female. Maybe there was one other female sometimes, but usually only female. And um, especially during longer meetings or strategy or anything to do with planning where the leadership team was together and we took um, a break and all the guys would go into the bathroom together and I would come out laughing and blah, blah. And yep. It's just really, really, really awkward at the least, but a lot of things were decisions we made in that bathroom where I could literally not go in. Exactly. That is a subtle act of exclusion. They didn't intend it, but that's the fact. It's important to separate the intention with the impact. The intention may have been good, but that doesn't erase the impact. And both intention and impact need to be held together in both places. Uh, another one sort of like that as a woman is you're in a room with many men and you're in a meeting and they ask you to take notes or they ask you to write on the right board because your writing is better, right? <laughs> yep, I've been there many times. <laughs> Anybody else? We'll just do a couple. Yeah, there's not examples yet, but people are saying, yeah, I felt out of place. Um, yeah, I, I have a lot more examples. I just don't want to dominate the conversation. <laughs> we'll move Someone on. said not feeling good enough. <laughs> yeah, great. Good. Okay, next commitment. Engage in courageous conversations. I commit to be more honest in my communication with others. I will strive not to hide, drift, disappear, appease, or attack, but be forthcoming and authentic in my engagements with others. I'm gonna move right to the Venn diagram about this because I think you all might find this really useful. So we've, I've put this, this comes from my book, Flying Lead Change, and I've put this diagram together uh, to kind of simplify courageous conversations. Let's start, uh, well, let me start here with, we have two, we have a horizontal line and a vertical line. The horizontal line represents the spectrum of kind of disappearing and not showing up for a conversation or ourselves or, or showing up. So it's the two extremes of the spectrum. And on the uh, vertical line on the spectrum of disconnection from self and other and connection. So let's start with the bottom right hand side where you're showing up for a conversation but you're disconnected, the bottom right hand side. So this comes across where, you know, this is where people blame and yell and attack and um, intimidate and dump that kind of. So you're in it, but you're in it in a very kind of attacking or oppressive way. The bottom right is where you are disconnected and disappearing. This is where you check out, you numb out, you withhold, you're just, you're just, you're like, well, they're never gonna listen to me and I'm just gonna like that. Then there's the upper right-hand side where you're connected probably more to the other, but you're disappearing yourself, right? 
So this is where the rescuer comes in. Um, crumb scraping, where you're like, well, I'll just take a, you know, I'm happy with just that much from the engagement. Um, where you're justifying yourself, uh, fixing, promising, pleasing, appeasing, that kind of thing. And then there's a sweet spot on the right hand upper side. That's where the transformational courageous conversations can happen. This is where you're connecting with yourself, you're connecting with other, and you're really showing up. You're feeling all feelings, you're processing those feelings, you're respectful about the impact that you might be having on the other. Um, you're staying in the fire, regardless of how like it might be hard to be in conflict, but you're really staying there to see it to the other side. And you're open for it to circle back around to, so that if more processing needs to happen, you're there. You're not just like, okay, now we're done with the conversation. It's challenging. You're challenging the other. There's a lot of candor in this, in this quadrant. So we're going to try something fun. I hope we can do this. You're, uh, if you, we're going to put ourselves in, that, in this little diagram I have here where you most, like, most tend to be. And to do that, you go up to the top of your screen to the little green bar that says that you see you're sharing my, my screen there. And then to the right is a little options. You click down to the word annotate. And when you click annotate, then there's a stamp. You can use a stamp or a squiggle. Just use a stamp, which you could have a star or a heart, and put yourself where you usually tend to, put, to be in conversations. Are you in that upper sweet spot quadrant or do you tend to kind of appease? Yep, so is that you, Magda? But these are anonymous. Sorry, Magda. These are anonymous, but, <laughs> but so you can know. In that case, I'm gonna, no, just yeah, kidding. great. So this is where you are. This is where not where you want to be, but where you are. Oh, someone just said, whoops. Where where do you tend to be? If I could annotate, I would I would kind of put myself upper leftish a little. If you know that's where I really have to work hard in the transformative place. But nobody knows who's putting their things up, so it is anonymous. Yeah, so just, sorry to interrupt. Um, so everyone, just you need to click into the Zoom screen. So let this, and then on the very top, there should be a, I actually think it's on the very top. Uh -huh. It's in yeah. view options. Um, people are saying they can't annotate. No. Oh. That sucks. Yes, maybe that's, that's okay, hold on. Because it's a webinar, huh? Oh. Maybe, but I have an idea. It can help. Um, okay, give me one second, guys. I'm just gonna. She's gonna see because stamping. My You have to have some fun here. Look, I just put myself. That's where I usually am. Okay, this is clearly not working. Sorry about that. I'm not sure why it didn't oh. work. Um, oh, that's okay. Yeah, it is. Host needs to enable that in settings. Hold on, where in settings? I do not see that anywhere. <laughs> View options, annotate. If someone tells me where to do it, I will happily do it, but I don't have an option to give you guys an option. Ah, I guess because we're in webinar, sometimes in meetings you can do it. So that might be, it yeah, may be. Sorry. It's fun to play with for those of you that do workshops online. <laughs> anyway, in your own mind, heart, just kind of place yourself where you tend to be because it's going to assist you to look at where you'd like to grow. Um, for example, for me, you know, I, I could do more showing up. I'm good with the connection part. I'm the heart. That's the heart piece there that I annotated, but, but I really, it's in showing up and having a little more um a little more robustness in in the conflict being willing to have conflict being willing to stay in the fire that's just speaking for me but you may have a different place do you tend to check out do you tend to like check out and then suddenly get really frustrated and then get angry you know just place yourself there and great 
Well, I'm not allowed to replace it because that's not letting me either. So fun stuff. But um, yeah, the more it's interesting, the more I go through the different list, I think I think I'm more next to you than I am where I put myself at first. <laughs> Good job. Well done. <laughs> thanks. Thanks. Yeah, great. Okay. Oops, I just annotated and I'm trying to like, now I don't want to annotate anymore. Now I need no. to move my cursor. So the next screen here, and I need to get out of annotation. This is now a problem. Yeah, uh, you need to click the close the view options. Oh, technology. Oh, technology. No, no. Close. Also, apologies for um, microaggression that we just, <laughs> um, what's it called, forced upon you. We asked you to use technology, taking for granted that you can't. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> We did a subtle act of exclusion. Thank you. When, assume, assuming <laughs> that everybody was a, a, a tech genius. <laughs> yes, Sorry. that's right. Well done. Well done. See, we're building better humans. Okay. Commitment number, number five. Change your optimal states into traits. Now, here's where it all gets really interesting. I commit to actively engaging in my body's neural networks to rewire it towards positive traits such as resilience, kindness, connection, strength happiness and joy and i will add any of those that you first talked about and wrote down in your journal compassion um taking 100 percent responsibility what that felt state feels like so according to rick hansen uh he's my uh neuroscientist mentor he's the author of the buddha's brain roughly 33 percent of our personal attributes we're stuck with but that means that 66% we can change of our whole self. This means we are empowered to, take, to really take charge of the person that we want to become. And all you have to know are some really basic principles and practices on how to hardwire yourself into different characteristics, different virtues and values. So this is really powerful for you individually, but if you, you can also teach this to your clients, you can teach this to your family members. Um, you know, there's a very small conversion rate in conventional coaching and in therapy, a very small conversion rate between people having insight and it actually, what I'm gonna call consolidating and integrating into people's lives, very small conversion rate. So without understanding how we turn traits into states, we end up leaving a ton of money on the table. So very, very simply, you start with what would be good to grow? What would be good to grow? So for me, just, you know, after that last slide, what would be good to grow in me is a sense of robustness. That's something I would like to grow so that I can show up in conversations better. So take one second, one moment, and think about one felt state that would be really good to grow for you. Let's just pick one. Okay, can be anything. And here's how we're going to do it and we're gonna play with it today. We're gonna to experience the felt sense of what you want to grow. We're gonna feel it in our bodies. And we're gonna do this together. So I'm just gonna show you this slide now. We're gonna extend that experience deliberately. In other words, we're gonna extend it into time, two or three minutes, and feel it somatically. Somatically means viscerally throughout your whole body. We're gonna focus on what is rewarding about that experience, what we like about it. And we're gonna feel it again before we go to sleep. And I would add, when you wake up in the morning. And we're gonna look for that experience showing up in our awareness throughout our day, okay? So what's amazing about this is that anything that we've worked on today, anything we've looked at, anything you aspire to, any felt sense, you can apply this. If you practice these steps every day for 40 days, you will begin to notice that you not only experience that felt state frequently, but that you notice circumstances that ignite that for you more and 
you create circumstances that ignite that for you more. And I'm gonna way oversimplify here, way oversimplify. So for any of you neuroscientists out there, I deeply apologize. What you're, what's happening is that you are in, in focusing on these felt states, you are actually creating new neural receptors. And those new neural receptors start to kind of sense and feel more of that experience. It's kind of like, you know, when you're shopping for new tires for your car and you are really hyper-focused on tires and then pretty soon that's all you do is see tires for a while. That's because you built new neural receptors or you're remodeling your home and you're looking at tile and all you do is see everybody's tile when you visit people's houses. That's because you've built new neural receptors. So that's how that works. So let's do it now. So think of a feeling that you want to have. And close your eyes for a moment. You can do this closing your eyes. And just like we did with the feeling all feelings, feel what that felt state feels like in your body. Get really viscerally acquainted with it and get granular. What does your posture feel like in that felt state? What, is your, what do your muscles feel like? What is your jaw doing? Your backbone, your chest? Is it big and warm and radiating? Is it soft and smooth? What is the tangible landscape that you feel? And now for two minutes, we're going to feel it deliberately and really drink it in. And as you drink it in, focus on what is rewarding about feeling that experience. What's rewarding about it? Keep staying with it. If your mind engages, just drop back into the body again. Really luxuriate in this, this experience that you are wanting in your life. And now you can open your eyes again. And you're invited to commit to doing this every night before you go to bed with this experience for 40 days and to also throughout the day, like put a post-it note somewhere and notice when it kind of shows up. Maybe you're in a conversation with a friend and suddenly that feeling shows up or maybe you're hearing some music and that feeling shows up. And when you notice it, pause, be with it, extend the experience for a few minutes. This is how you turn a state into a trait. So I'm going to open up the floor to some questions. Any questions? You can ask me anything. I'm going to scroll. I don't. Um... Somebody earlier asked about your, your matrix. Um... Can you be in two places versus the context? Not sure what that means, but can you be in two different places on that? Sure. I mean, if you, you can, yes. So if I understand your question correctly, um, you could, you know, you could tend to either appease or shut down. Um, you might find that you, you, you kind of emphasize one over the other. But I would say you can be, I don't, I'm not sure if you could be in two places at once. I'd have to, I'd have to uh, kind of, I don't, I'm not sure if you could do that, 
but you could have a proclivity towards several of those places, which is great. You just need to know what might be a deeper inquiry into that is what conditions set you up to get, say, in the lower blaming finger pointing quadrant. You know, do you get scared? Do you not feel safe? What conditions set you up to, you know, disappear and withdraw? What conditions set you up to sort of please and appease and rescue? And, and what, based on that, what do you want to, what state do you want to build into your life so that you can show up in that upper right-hand quadrant? So you just use a word that um, resonates with me a little bit, rescue, which is why I moved my <laughs> indicator earlier, because I do tend to do that. I, I definitely am a fixer. Um, I'm a get things done. I know what I'm doing. Just let me help you kind of person. Um, but I don't see how it's necessarily bad. Like I can see how it can be bad. And I've been on the receiving end of it turning bad, but I don't necessarily think that it's terrible. So can you talk to me about mm. that? Well, that's, that's a great question. So you, you probably want to feel into your body to feel the difference between rescuing and um, empowering or mm, okay. teaching, right? So <clears throat> rescuing tends to be more, um, you're holding the other person small or you just don't have time for them to have the learning curve or you know, there, there's some elements there. So, to, so pay attention because those of us who are really capable of getting things done and making things happen, that's an edge where we have to make sure that we're not, um, we're just not holding the other person small because then we're not helping them at all, right? Because we're, 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 um, we're de denying them, you know, a chance for them to grow. And, mm -hmm. and I think if you, you're, you'll notice in my work, I'm very much into the body because I, be, I believe that the body tells, if you're feeling anxious, you might want to like check in. Because I think when your anxiousness shows up, it means you're overreaching past your 100%, right? Right? Because yeah, actually when we right. were talking <laughs> earlier, when you said, if when I just take my 100% and not 120, I, I don't feel anxious. I feel more. So let your body help you tell the difference. It'll, it'll light up with anxiousness when you're, when you're overreaching. Yeah. Yeah. Um, someone's asking, how can we identify a state? Is an emotion or feeling in the body, for example, is courage a state? Yes, courage is a state. Um, you get to decide what's a state. Um, states are different than emotion, right? They're, I mean, you could, you could say generically, it's all sensation, right? It's all sensation. It, conventionally, people think of emotion as happiness, sadness, grief, joy. But when we say state, it's a bit broader. You know, what does courage feel like? What does, um, what does, you know, uprightness feel like? So you can you can define your own states. Does that answer your question? For me, it does. But I don't know about John. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, are, uh, uh, please ask your questions in the chat. But it just occurred to me that uh, for those of you who are enjoying this, which I am. There's a session tomorrow with Tony Woods, who is um, looking at this from an art perspective. Uh -huh. So um, just as we were talking about describing uh, these things, tomorrow you actually get to draw them along with him. So I highly encourage you to please come to that too and get a different aspect of this exact same thing. Well, not exact uh -huh. same. You know what uh -huh. I mean. Uh -huh. um, Oh, I want to follow up on that courage question. And, and you also get to decide what courage feels like. What courage feels like somatically in your body is going to be very different than what courage feels like in my body. So you get to decide what state you want. And you're the one who decides what is it actually, when I embody courage, what is it? And you can even see for me, I go, you know, even my posture changes. Um, so what, you know, what happens for you when you embody courage? And that's what you want to map and track and, and uh, consolidate in your body. 
so I told you guys to have your questions ready at the beginning of the session. <laughs> but everyone's just experiencing versus thinking um, of questions. <laughs> so I will wait for those to come in. There are no um, bad. Yeah, there's no bad questions. Only bad people. Mm -hmm. I'm just kidding. <laughs> No, I know I'll stop talking. Um, so for me, um, I'll ask another one. When we're coaching people, um, because of me tending to veer to that left, I know for me it's a challenge just to not lead uh, the person. And when, when I'm listening to you and uh, you're talking about, you know, describing these states in our own words, um, when we're working with a client, I mean, it's hard to not use these labels. Uh, how, what am I trying to ask? When you're working with a client, how, what, what should you be asking? How can you get them to describe uh, these things? I'm just, uh, I'm specifically thinking of a couple of family members that I know would be like, huh? If I ask them to work this way. Um, uh, a great question so you can lead them quite easily so for example I did it at the beginning of our call when I the question I had asked was what would it be like if I can't remember what the rest of the question was you know it, if we took a hundred percent responsibility I think was the question what would it be like and of course what would it be like is a very you know typical coaching question you notice that so many people said well it would feel la 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 right so Right there, it's such an easy thread. So, okay, so tell me about that feeling. Oh, well this, it, you know, oh, I would feel happy. Well, what does happiness feel like in your body, right? Sometimes though, so you can see I'm sort of stair-stepping people down from the cognitive of like, oh, I'd feel, that would feel good. Well, how would it feel good? I feel happy. Well what does happiness feel like? And then they start to drop into their body. Um, some people get worried with the word body still. Um, and so you may want to set your clients up for success and let them know that you're learning things about how somatics work in coaching, how the body gets rewired. Um, you can, you know, Rick Hansen's a great resource, rickhansen.net, S-O-N. Um, he'll be on my handout. Um, Amanda Blake's book on your body is your brain. She's a coach and a neuroscientist and it's amazing. Um, and you can give them a heads up and say, I'd really love to assist you to turn to really change some habits in your life. And this is how we can do it. And so I will be asking you questions about how these things show up neurologically for you in your body. And so then they don't get freaked out suddenly. Why are you talking about bodies? So does that help? Mm -hmm. Definitely. Mm -hmm. uh, someone's asking, some clients are challenged by staying with a feeling. How can we ease the process for them? It's a great question. Often because they have been conditioned to imagine that, you know, there's good feelings and there's bad feelings. So, um, you know, and I, I depart from some classical coaching points of view where, you know, I shouldn't be teaching anything. But if I have the information that there's a possibility to reframe emotions into pleasant and unpleasant, that what the reason she's having or she or he is having a hard time or they are having a hard time um, being with feelings is because they're having meta emotions about those feelings. Um, this feels difficult, it, you know, this means something about me or I may never stop feeling this way. And so there's a whole lot of that. And so your job is to help them take away the feelings they have about their feelings and give them permission and safety. And you can hold that space with them. You can actually say, I'm going to feel it with you so that they are departing from this, like, this is a bad feeling. And it's okay, it's just unpleasant. It doesn't mean anything about you. Just be with it and let's see what happens. And you can even say something like that. Let's just see what happens. Let's be with it together. I'm gonna to be with it with you. And if you're really sensitive, you can actually feel it with them and really feel it with them. And invite them to experience like we did today on the call. And I even say things like, you know what? And if you, if 
if you don't like it, we can always go back to hating your feelings or we can always go back to, you know, separating from your feelings, but just give them as much sort of permission and, and uh, curiosity that they can meet it with curiosity as possible. I like that. Um, just uh, one last question on this too. What if you have a particular tendency or preference to feel one way? How do you experience it, not label it, and still try to change it for the better for you? <laughs> okay, wait. Can you read that again? So what if you have a particular tendency to feel one way? So I'm always excited. I don't know. Um, how do you experience it, not label it, but still try to change it? Oh, see, there's the, there's the, uh, <clears throat> there's the fly in the ointment, as we say in uh, New Mexico, um, trying to change it. What, you know, you've probably heard this a million times, but what you resist persists. So if there's, and I'm assuming it's a, 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 um, a feeling that you're not liking, but you would love to change it and it shows up all the time. That's my um, assumption I'm making. Part of why it stays alive in you, my guess, is because of the resistance you have for that feeling. And again, as if the reframe is it's just weather patterns, uh, it's just life force. Some people live in Seattle and it's cloudy all the time in Seattle. Some people live in Arizona and the sun is shining and there's never any rain at all, which I could hardly tolerate myself. But, and so, these are weather patterns. You, you may be a Seattle person, a London person. Um, and for you, the challenge is to be okay with what shows up in your body as is. And, and just experiment and see what being radically okay with that feeling does in your life. Give yourself a chance to be radically okay with it for 30 days and see what happens. But if there's that little thing here going, oh, and then it'll shift, it's gonna keep you in the loop. So okayness with everything as is. Just like you wouldn't argue with the sun shining or the clouds coming or the wind, you, why would you argue with it? So what shows up in here, same. We have no control over it. It just comes, it goes, it comes, it stays. Just be okay with it. It's advice that I needed to hear. <laughs> um, Kelly, we have about five minutes left and I am keen to hear about your book because... Uh, thank you. I, well, I'll but I don't know what other closing thoughts you have. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those are my closing yeah, thoughts. No. So, Good. thank you. Um, so I'm just going to open up the screen here for um, some... Um, websites for you. Um, we have a link to downloads for the handouts that have lots of resources, um, has that Venn diagram of the Courageous Conversations and the Jedi model and the one, two, three, four, five step for um, turning traits into turning states into traits. Um, Equusinspired.com forward slash building hyphen better hyphen humans. That's where you can get those. Um, my book that was released yesterday <clears throat> is called um, Flying Lead Change, 56 Million Years of Wisdom for Leading and Living. And it is a book that combines coaching, uh, nature-based science, contemplative wisdom, and neuroscience, and indigenous wisdom. So I weave all the elements of um, the way that I work with people into um, and two, building better humans, basically. So a lot of what we've been playing with today is in the book, plus a whole lot more. Uh, it's a different sort of book. There's a lot of how-tos, but it also, because it's, um, because it's about the human story, there are a lot of stories. Um, there are uh, teaching stories from indigenous people around the world, which are very, very powerful because there's so much about um, that wisdom that we have lost um, today. And I think part of building better humans is to not throw away the past, but weave in what 
has been um, has been a principle of thriving and flourishing for uh, well, if you look at nature, 3.8 billion years. So if we if we bring in some of that wisdom, that ancient wisdom, um, it will help us for contemporary times to be sure. So flyingleadchange.com is a web is a, a page where you can download a free excerpt of the book and also purchase it from major booksellers around the world. Um, Amazon India, Amazon UK, Amazon um, Australia has it and other major booksellers as well. And then kellywendorf.com um, is my coaching website. Um, so, so yeah. I wonder, should we put it in the chat, um, Magda, so people can... Um, Already did. See, just so ahead of me. <laughs> That, that's all if I have. There's one thing I can do. It's type. <laughs> <laughs> we have we have three more minutes. If anybody has any last things to share, um, any insights that showed up, insights. Your your wisdom is so much more profound and meaningful and useful than than mine. So anything you want to share with the community while we have three minutes, would love that. Um, and it's been an absolute delight to to be with you. And Magda, thank you so much for being my my wing woman. Thank you. Thank you. It's my pleasure. For me, like not being controlled by the past, I, I already try to live in the present. Uh, I try to live in the future, frankly. Um, but yeah, the one thing that gets me is whenever I, I feel weak, when I, I tend to go back to all, well, it's justifiable because I went through what I went through. Mm -hmm. And I think mm -hmm. I'd stop doing that. I need to just, like you said, just be okay with it. Just live with it. Um, mm -hmm. And hopefully it won't bother me. I can take more ownership of when things don't go so well or when I do feel crappy. It's uh -huh. okay to feel crappy. I don't need to fix it. I can just feel crappy. Experiment with that and then let me know in a few weeks what you discover. I will be really interested to know. I will. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, Thank you. Especially everybody. important now because like, you know, like you said, the world is not in a great spot. So, um, and it's especially for those of us who are in the US, things are not gonna change anytime soon. Right, yes. Because it's just getting worse right now uh, with COVID, et cetera. So we need to yeah. find these techniques to be able to, to get through it and not let it, not let it um, rule us. I think two words that I would like to leave everybody with is capacity. You know, uh, that would be capacity to feel things, capacity to experience things. So we make ourselves broader as human beings. And robustness is another word that I'm, that we are robust in ourselves, that we can meet the moment with that robustness and we can call forth, call in and call forward the robustness of others so that we can so we can not just survive these times, but flourish and thrive. and. May we do so, yeah. We will, thank you so much, Kelly. Thank you Thanks. so much for everyone who attended um, and everyone who's watching this or listening to it in the future. Um, if you are listening to it, check the episode notes for links that we had on the screen because you would have not seen the screen. Um, but yeah, thank you so much. Uh, Flying Lead Change is Kelly's book. We all need to read it. Um, the handout is also in the chat. I will make sure that it makes it to the episode notes, both on YouTube and in the podcast, so you can download um, the handout. Uh, I just looked at it and it's quite handy. Mm. Um, frankly, Kelly, I think you can do a book just on building better humans because this session was incredibly amazing and um, I'm going to be rewatching it and taking copious notes. Great, wonderful, wonderful. Thank you everybody. <laughs> Thank you so much for everything you're doing, Magda. Yeah. Thank you. Have a beautiful and day, day, everybody. A beautiful night. Beautiful night, beautiful whatever. And um, <laughs> for those of you who want to learn more, which should be all of you, we have three more sessions tomorrow at Awake Aware Arise. And next week we have 12, 12 more. And then we're done. Um, so we'll be back to our regular weekly schedule. But thank you so much for your support, everyone. It's lovely to be here with you. <laughs>